<laughs> I will begin. Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for the students. Just pray that you uh, just bless this time we have together, that we just learn, learn a little bit more about uh, group actions and all that. I just pray that you continue to uh, uh, keep the students' spirits up and help them to persevere in the face of difficulty. Lord, in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, let's see here. So, um, let me uh, get to it here. So, last class, um, you know, we were working on group actions and, and so forth. And uh, one of the actions that's interesting, of course, was the, we, we looked at this one, right? We looked at if you have a subgroup of permutations generated by a particular one, sigma, then um, if you look at the orbits, what it does is it just moves the numbers in each uh, particular cycle in the disjoint cycle factorization of sigma, right? Like, for example, if you're looking at sigma 1, 2, 3, 4, then 5, 6, then 7, 8, well, it moves 1, 2, 3, 4 amongst itself, right? So the orbit of 1 is the set 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, the orbit of 5, well, 5 goes to 6 under, under sigma, right? Um, and again, the, the action that we're talking about here is just this one. Permutation acting on X is just equal to alpha of X. This is one, one kind of um, group action you can think about associated to a, a group of permutations. There are others. Um, so let's see here, orbit of seven, seven, eight. And then since nine and 10 don't appear here, well, they just, they just stay put, right? So what I wanna do in the next five, 10 minutes or so is just focus a little bit further on um, the story, the corresponding story for conjugation as it respects um, the permutation group. So if I look at a permutation and I conjugate it, what, what, what happens to the permutation is the question I want to ask right now. And I'm going to illustrate, rather than giving you some, you know, all overarching technical theorem to prove it to you, I'm going to give you a sort of proof by example, which of course is not a proof, but I think it'll probably be more understandable to you. Yeah, but you might, you might believe me. Um, so let's look at conjugation of a permutation. In this case, I'm going to look at 1, 2, 3, 4, like this, right, in S4. What happens if I, well, I say conjugate by 1, 2, 3, but then I conjugate by 1, 2, 4, and I conjugate by 2, 3, and I conjugate by 1, 2, 3, 4, and I conjugate by 1, 2. So here I have a list of conjugates, all right? Um, so what got me thinking about this is yesterday in the help session, I was looking back and I made a claim about a previous homework and I got like, oh no, it's not right. Because I had a wrong, I had a wrong idea in my mind. I thought if I conjugated by a permutation, then it, um, it would just leave the cycle unchanged. That's not true. L look what happens. Conjugate alpha by one, two, three. Of course, one, two, three inverse is just three, two, one, right? So when I multiply these out, I get one, four, two, three. All right, conjugate by one, two, four. Multiply these out, one, three, two, four. Multiply by, conjugate by two, three. Two, three, one, two, three, four, two, three, which arcs out to one, three, two, four. All right, you can easily check these. It's the usual cycle calculation, right? Um, let's see here. You know, let's, again, conjugating by one, two, three, four gives me one, four, two, three. Conjugating by one, two, gives me one, two, three, four. So check it out. Like what, what, what's common to all of these? What, what, what makes these, what's the same about all these? It's all the same. Well, yeah, I mean, but there's only one, two, three, four, so that's inescapable. It keeps the same form. Yeah. So, so yeah, so a technical term for the form you're talking about is called cycle type. So these are all formed by a product of two transpositions. Right, we start, alpha has got two transpositions building it, right? Disjoint transpositions, and, or two cycles if you like. And when you conjugate, back out again, same cycle type. Um, you notice if I conjugate by either of the cycles in the disjoint cycle permutation of alpha, what happens? It just stays put, right? So you can, you can see that alpha conjugated by one, two gives you back alpha again. The same thing would happen if we conjugate by, oh man. Uh, I just charged you, behave. All right, um, if we conjugated by, come on, three, four. So let's see here, what's that give us? Come on, 
Come back. Oh, woo. All right, so in short, let's scroll down a bit here. What we have is that we have this preservation of cycle type under conjugation, right? Um, if I looked at a different one, just to show you it's not some quirk of alpha, if I look at beta equals one, two, three, four, which is a four cycle, right? And I conjugate by one, two, what happens? I get, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll even go through the calculation for you. One goes to two, two goes to three, three stays put, one, three, three, let's see here, three, three goes to four, four stays put, so we go to four, then four, where's four go? Nowhere. Four goes to one, one goes to two. All right, and then where's two go? Two goes to one, one goes to two, two goes back to one again, so there we go, full cycle. One, three, four, two. As you can see, conjugation of a four cycle produced a four cycle, right? Same cycle type before and after. Or here's a three cycle. We can conjugate a three cycle um, gamma by one, two, four. And again, what will pop back out is two, four, three in a cursor. So let's see here, stupid cursor. I hate you. All right, sorry. No, I, I don't hate the cursor. Let's see here. Um, Curse the cursor. No, no, no. Where's the term cursor come from? Anyway, sorry. Um, what's that? Cursory? Cursory? Huh. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's something to. Anyway, okay. I digress. So, anyway, the point here is that conjugation preserves cycle type. All right? So put a different way, if you wanted to look at the set of all permutations which were conjugate to one another, how would they be related? They all would have the same cycle type, right? So that's the significance in part of the, that list I drew for you last class, which I'll get back to here again in a second. Here's a generalization of that example, um, which I won't really prove. I'm just kind of telling you that this generalizes and I'm stating it without proof. If you have beta 1, beta 2, da da da, beta t, a disjoint cycle factorization of alpha and Sn, if you conjugate by any other permutation, then what you get back is gamma 1, gamma 2, da da da, da gamma t, where this is a disjoint, a disjoint cycle factorization of the conjugated permutation and um, the order of, I can, I can arrange them so that the order of gamma 1 is equal to the order of beta 1 and so forth, right? If they're disjoint cycles, they commute, so you can arrange them in some order. You match the order up and you can get this result. If you like, put them in increasing order, like so I'll put the two cycles and then the three cycles and then the R cycles, whatever. Anyway, the point is, this is not a quirk of this example. It is generally true that conjugation preserves cycle type. All right? You'll forgive me if I don't prove that in gory detail in here. All right? Corollary to the orbit stabilizer theorem is as follows, if G is a finite group, the number of conjugates to X is the index of the centralizer. So this is the number of conjugates. You take G, X, G inverse from with G in the, in the group, that's the number of conjugates of X. I'm saying that that is equal to the index of the centralizer. What's the index of the centralizer? It's the number of left cosets of the centralizer in G, right? This is the index of the centralizer. Um, so check it out. If we consider the action of G on itself by conjugation, what's the orbit? Well, the orbit of X is G X G inverse, right? Um, that's just the definition of orbit under conjugation, right? That's exactly the conjugacy class though, isn't it? I mean, that, excuse me, that is the, the set of conjugates of X, all right? Um, what's the stabilizer of X? The stabilizer of X is G and G such that G X G inverse is equal to X again. But as we discussed last time, if you just multiply X, G, G on both sides, that gives you G X equals to X G, which is a centralizer of X, all right? I know I did some of this last class, but I want to go through it again. It's important for you to understand it. Okay, so the orbit stabilizer theorem, what does it say? It says that the order of the orbit of X is equal to the index of the stabilizer of X, all right? In other words, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between orbits and left cosets. Um, okay, anyway, so what does that say? In this context, it says the number of conjugates is equal to the index of the centralizer, we're done. So that's, that's pretty, pretty nice. Now, I don't know about you, but this is getting very old very fast, right? As a notation for all the conjugates. So 
a very popular um, notation for the set of conjugates of a particular element in a group used by these, these creatures called group theorists. I'm not a group theorist, I just teach some group theory to you guys. Um, is as follows. This seems to be a popular notation. I've seen it more than one book. Um, so the conjugacy class of X in a group G is defined to be X to the, X to the G. Um, I mean, my personal, my personal uh, inclination is to write GX, G inverse, but I guess that wouldn't be a very good shorthand. But that is kind of what it is more. Anyway, here it is. X to the G is the set of conjugates of X under G, right? So this is a pretty nice shorthand. You'll see that that shorthand pays off in this. So in the language we just introduced, the order um, of X to the G, the size of X to the G, in other words, the order of the conjugacy class of X, is the index of the centralizer. All right. Here's a theorem, a corollary. This is a corollary to the corollary. It's like a flower on a flower. Um, the number of permutations in the symmetric group with n elements is a, per excuse me, symmetric group on n symbols. This, of course, has order and factorial. Um, with a the number of permutations with a particular cycle type must divide and factorial. Why is that true? Well, group action um, of S on N and by itself, X, by conjugation, we can consider that. What are the conjugacy classes? Well, I just explained to you the conjugacy classes of the, um, you know, uh, set of permutations are exactly the set of permutations with the same cycle type, right? So the order of the conjugacy class is exactly the number of permutations with the same cycle type as the thing we're conjugating, sigma, right? So I apply the corollary, and that gives me that the order of the conjugacy class is equal to the index of the centralizer, right? But we know that the index of the centralizer has this formula, right? The order of the centralizer group times the order of the index of the, centra the, index of the centralizer has to be equal to the order of the group. This is essentially the Grange's theorem again, right? And so if this is equal to n factorial, it follows that this thing, right, must divide n factorial. So there you have it. And that's why we got this pattern. You see the number of cycle types, just one cycle, you know, the identity cycle type, just this one, there's just one of those. Uh, how many transpositions is there in S4? There are six, right? I could list them for you if it would make it better, I don't know. What are the two, what are the, I'm not going to do that, you guys can do that. Let me just say it, one, two, one, three, one, four, two, three, two, three, two, four, three, four. Those are the distinct two cycles in S4. Um, so anyway, as you can see, 1, 6, 8, 6, and 3, these are all divisors of 24, which is 4 factorial, right? That's not an accident. That is exactly what this says. But there's more than that, right? The sum of these numbers of cycle types, of course, has to be equal to 24 as well, right? Because the cycle types partition all the cycles, which collectively form S4. So the sum of these numbers also has to be um, that. You know, there's kind of like a neat number theory thing to say here, isn't there? I haven't typed this up, and I, I'm missing a word. I, I forget what this is called. But if you look at it, we can take n factorial, right? It can be written as a sum of um, particular divisors. I don't know if that's especially interesting, but it's true. Right, like we have n factorial is equal to a1 plus a2 plus da da da, da plus a, a sub r, where um, a sub i divides n factorial for i equals to 1, 2, da 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 r. I mean, that would be sort of a corollary to the corollary. So would be the third order flower? I don't know. Um, the reason I say this is because the number of cycle types, right? Each, the number of each given cycle type has to be, what I'm thinking of is the number of cycle types, number, number of cycles of a particular type is a sub i, right? And I know that the sum of all the cycles has to be n, n factorial because that's how many permutations there are in Sn, right? And then as we've seen, each one of these has to be a divisor. So there's some way to rewrite n factorial as a sum of 
proper divisors. I don't know if that's especially surprising. Maybe not. No, I guess it's not. I mean, I guess I could write n factorial as like, let me stop. <laughs> I think I could do something stupid with n factorial and get this result easier. There's something more significant about it than that. All right. Hey, come on, come back to us. Silly thing. So I think um, I am, of course, of. I think for your homework, I will ask you to do this example, but for S5. All right. This is one of those homeworks that's due on the question day. So I try not to be too mean. Here's part of me not being mean. 120. Hmm, that's an interesting number. You might notice it's 1 plus 10 plus 20 plus 30 plus 24 plus 20 plus 15. Interesting numbers. All right. <laughs> so anyway, there's a there's a, a, a particularly generous hint for that homework problem, which I have not formally written yet. But do you see what the homework problem is without me writing it? If you want, okay. But I will write it, but I'm just saying. All right. Now that this brings us to man. Sorry, I'm having issues. What? Fine. I give up. So here's the, here's the theorem. This is Cauchy's theorem. If G is a finite group with order divisible by a prime P, all right, then G contains an element of order P. I've made no assumption that G is cyclic or even that G is abelian. Right? One of your homework problems is to prove this in the context that G is abelian. All right. I'll try to give you a little bit of guidance on that. That is not as simple a homework problem as the one I just told you about before this. To prove this result from the case that G is an abelian, a finite abelian group, is still a little bit involved, but it's not quite as complicated as this. And this actually isn't that complicated. You should be able to follow the proof I'm about to tell you. It's a beautiful proof. Of course, I've made it clumsy. But anyway, um, <clears throat> let me try here. So assume G is a finite group with order divisible by a prime P. OK? We're going to prove this by induction on the order of the group. I don't know if I've done a proof like this in here yet. You know, anything that's got an N attached to it, you can do induction on. But I don't know, to me, that you can make an argument by induction on the order of a group. I don't, it's just a fascinating thing to me that this is a meaningful argument. It's very imaginative. I don't think this is the sort of thing I would have ever thought of doing from a perspective of just working with equations, you know? Anyway, I digress. OK, so suppose you've got a finite group, order divisible by prime p. We're going to prove it by induction on the order of g. First of all, if the order of g is 1, there are no prime divisors of 1, so there's nothing to check. All right, so it's trivially true in the case n equals 1. Suppose then that G has um, order n, and suppose that the theorem holds for, for groups up to order n minus 1. In other words, we're using strong induction. I'm assuming the induction hypothesis holds for any n less than a given n. All right? Um, suppose you've got an element of G, all right? Then the conjugacy class of x, right, is equal to the index of the centralizer, right? Now, the centralizer is a subgroup. We've proved that before, right? And so if it's a subgroup, um, and if there is no point, right, if there's nothing in the center of G, if G, if, if there's no non-identity element in the center of the group, what does that mean? That means that the, um, <clears throat> that means that, oh, words, the center, um, the centralizer of x is a proper subgroup of G, and hence the order is smaller than G. Let me just elaborate on that. Why is it, if we have x in the element, x is x an element of the center of G, what would that mean? That means that xG is equal to Gx for all G and G, right? But what's that mean? That means that um, Gx G inverse is an element, uh, excuse me, is equal to x, right, for all g and g. What's that mean? x, in our new notation, the conjugates of x is just what? 
It's just the, it's the singleton. It's just the set containing X itself. All right. So, um, so we're looking at, again, we're looking here at X and G and, um, you know, counting the conjugates, um, counting the, the conjugate, the, the number of conjugates of X and G is the index of the centralizer, right? So provided that X is not in the center, that means that the conjugacy class of X has more than one element, right? Now, if X is in the center, the conjugacy class just has one thing in it. But if X is not in the center, that means that there's more than one thing here, right? If there's more than one thing here, what's that say? That says that the center of X, uh, the centralizer of X is a, is a subgroup of G. Um, why can't it be all of G? Why is the centralizer of X not all of G? So I actually brought my adapter. Is it just that the centralizer of X can't be all of G because X is in G and not G? Well, the centralizer of X, when would the centralizer of X be all of G? Right. So again, um, it's your homework problem to prove that the result holds if G is abelian. So. Set that case aside, all right? Assume G is not abelian. So the centralizer of X is not all of G as well, all right? Okay. I guess I'm missing a little qualifier here, right? Are you guys with me? So we have the subgroup of the centralizer of X is a proper subgroup of G. Um, now, then there are cases to consider, right? If P divides the centralizer of X for some X, which is not in the center of G. I mean, again, I'm assuming that this is a non-central X, as it's called, something not in the center. Well, what does that mean? By the induction hypothesis, we've got, we have P divides a group of order less than the order of the group. So it follows that the center of X has an element of order P. Consequently, G has an element of order P, all right? On the other hand, we should study the case that P does not divide the centralizer of X. The, the um, oh, I'm sorry. This should say there's. What am I missing here? This doesn't make sense, right? I'm missing some order symbols there. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, so think about this then. Suppose P does not divide um, the order of the centralizer of X. Remember that we are assuming P divides the order of G. We also know that G is equal to the index of the centralizer of X times the order of the centralizer of X again by Lagrange's theorem. And now this is a, a result, I think I proved this earlier here, I'm not sure. Euclid's lemma says what? It says that if you've got a, if you've got a product of two things, A and B, and a prime divides that product, either the prime divides one thing in the product or the other thing in the product, right? So primes are sort of indestructible. They, they have to fit into one or other of the products if, if they're dividing the whole, whole product. You can't take a prime and split it a little bit into A and a little bit into B, like it's in one or the other. The fact then that the prime is not in the index forces, excuse me, the fact that the prime is not in the order of the centralizer forces the prime to divide the index in that case, right? So P divides the order of the index. But we also know from our study of orbits and stabilizers that if we look at the conjugacy classes of the group, we have this equation, right? The order of the group, it's equal to the number of things that form singletons under conjugacy classes. In other words, the center of the group, that's the order of the center. That's the number of singleton conjugacy classes, right? This, and then plus the sum of the indexes of the indices of the, um, the non-central X's. We take, we take one X sub I from each conjugacy class uh, under conjugation. So this Again, is just that the order of the group has to, the order of this, you know, we have the group acting on a set 
and the, the sum of the sizes of the stabilized sizes of the orbits has to give us back the size of the group. And that's this, this, this equation here. This is, again, the orbit stabilizer. It's not even the orbit stabilizer theorem. It's before that. It's when we prove that the orbits partition the group on which it acts. If a group acts on itself under conjugation, you know, that's, here's that, that result. But check it out, right? What do we got? We got P what? P divides this, right? And we're assuming P divides that. So what is that force? That force is P to divide the center, the order of the center of the group, all right? And now we go back to your homework problem again. The center of group is an abelian group. So if P divides the order, it has an element of order P, but the center is a subgroup of G. Consequently, G has a element of order P. So again, divide by P, divided by P, that forces the center to be divisible by, by P. The center is an abelian group. So that means by your homework problem that um, P divides the center. Um, P has an element of order Z. The center has an element of order P, rather. All right? So there you have it. This is Cauchy's theorem, a, a, um, a group which ha a finite group which has order divisible by prime has to have an element of that, that order, of order P. And consequently, of course, if it has an element of order P, that of course means also that it has a subgroup of order what? P, right? Because you can take the cyclic subgroup generated by the element. So if I have a group of order, you know, you pick your favorite order. If I have the, uh, if I have a group and the order of the group is 11 times 13 times, you know, pick your favorite large prime. You guys know any large primes? 53. There's a, there's a fairly famous story of, of Grothendieck being asked if he could give a specific example. I mean, if you don't know who Grothendieck is, he's, well, he changed mathematics in such a way that you were probably just hearing about him now. Okay, so he changed mathematics at a level above which you have seen. All right, and what he did <laughs> is awful and sobering and will completely change the way we think about everything. And it hasn't quite filtered down to this level just yet. I mean, <laughs> anyway. But anyway, Grothendieck was asked for, you know, could you give me an example, give, give an example, and he's like, of a prime, blah, 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 that does such and such. And I think he said 41, which is, was 41, 41 a prime? Oh, it wasn't 41, 51, I think is what he said. Right, I know, that was the, that was the kind of funny thing. <laughs> but anyway, um, is 53 a prime? I don't know. I guess it is. Anyway, the point is, if the order of G is 11 times 13 times 53, that, by Cauchy's theorem, we can immediately conclude that there is, in fact, a subgroup of order 11. There's a subgroup of order 13. And you know what? There's also a subgroup of order 53. So Lagrange's theorem did not give this to us. Lagrange's theorem told us that the order of a subgroup had to divide the order of the group, right? But it didn't give us proof positive that those subgroups actually existed, right? It's kind of like in Calculus 1, you learn Fermat's theorem, which says that, hey, if there is a min or a max, if there's something extremal going on, that has to be a place where the derivative is zero or what, or it's undefined. But it doesn't say that when you have a critical point, it's necessarily a maximum or a minimum, right? In the same way Lagrange's theorem says, these are the possible orders of subgroups. It doesn't tell you that there actually are subgroups there defined. What this theorem is saying is that if you have a prime divisor of the order of a group, there is a subgroup there defined. All right, it's inescapable. This is Cauchy's theorem. Well, in a perfect world, I would have uh, had a few more things to project here, but, you know, it's not a perfect world. So instead, I'm giving you a handout. So the next thing beyond this, really, is the CELO theorems. Um, this is a handout. I got a couple pages from Beachy and Blair, and I think another page from, I want to say Nicholson. Um, Now, I'm not expecting you, I, I don't expect that you know the statement of the CELO theorems, all right? I don't even expect that 
you're able to apply them. In fact, I'd rather that you didn't. What I want from you is to listen to this discussion and try to appreciate these theorems for what they are. All right. If you want to see a proof of these things and further discussion, the um, YouTube lectures by uh, Professor Gross of Harvard, I think they have more on the CeeLo theorems. CeeLo, you know, there, there's a few of these characters you run across in, in, in math that I find deeply fascinating. Um, he is a high school teacher, this guy. Um, here, let me, let me read it for you a second here. There's a little bio of him in uh, Nicholson. Let me take a second to read it for you. Yeah, this is Introduction to Abstract Algebra, third edition by Keith Nicholson, one of my many places to conspire against you. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I don't view my students as adversaries. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. Let's see. Peter Ludwig, I don't know how to say that name, M-E-J-D-E-L-L, -L. Peter Ludwig Med Med Medjdel Silo. 1832 to 1918. Silo was born in Norway and spent most of his professional life as a high school teacher in Halden. Despite onerous teaching duties, he found time to study the works of Abel, and in 1862 to 1863 he gave lectures on Galois theory, permutation groups, at Christiana University in Oslo. Silo theorems were published, first published in 1872 for permutation groups. Remember, group theory was really just about permutations in the 19th century for the most part. And, um, then in um, 1887, Frobenius, um, and if you, were, if you were taking differential equations with me, I would make the comment, none of you are, but I would make the comment that the Frobenius theorem of differential equations, the same Frobenius. Like Frobenius is a, is a beast. He was, he was the one that really first wrote a linear algebra book that was a linear algebra book, perhaps. I mean, he did things in n dimensions rather than just two or three. And, and rather generally. Um, anyway, these theorems are among the important results on finite groups. Silo applied them to show that any equation whose Galois group has prime power order is solvable by radicals. In addition to his study of groups, Silo spent eight years editing the works of Abel. After his retirement as teaching high school, he was appointed to the chair of Christiana <laughs> University, a position he held for the rest of his life. It's like, well, you know, it's don't hear about that happening too much. It's like, uh, who's the new chair of mathematics at UVA? It's like, well, he's uh, done working at the local high school. He's going to go and chair the math department there. Like, that just doesn't seem to happen much anymore, does it? No? Okay, so, yeah. You should do that here. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retire and go work at high school. No. <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't that be funny? Please do. I, was, I would honestly. And still, like. <laughs> I, I, do, I do hope to teach my children high school math. Let's see here. Um, what's a sabbatical? I'm just kidding. We don't have them here. Anyway, um, well, I mean. We've been told that we have them, but I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. It's like, I just got to go ask my chair. It's like, hey, you know, find somebody to cover my classes for the next year. Um, I know we're all teaching overloads and, you know, have no possible way of covering additional classes, but I just want to go write a book next semester. I don't think it would be, it would not be cool to my colleagues, let's say. I don't know. Anyway, some students might rejoice. I don't know. Let's see here. Let G be a finite group. If P is a prime, here's the first, the first CeeLo theorem. Um, some people say silo. I have no idea. I'm just saying CeeLo. I, I made a choice. Stick and do it. Um, if P is a prime such that P to the power alpha is a divisor of the order of G for some alpha greater than zero, then G contains a group of order P to the alpha. So this is kind of a beefed up version of Cauchy's theorem, right? Like, we just proved for a prime, there's an element. 
of order that prime, right? He's saying prime to a power, all right? And I won't go through it, but if you kind of glance over the proof, you notice that the proof, what is it about? It's group actions. It's the conjugacy action. It's arguments just like we just went through, right? I'm not putting that on you because I know you guys are kind of like reaching your breaking point, so I, I don't want to go <laughs> further than where we are. I think it's a good amount of material. There's still something I'm covering Friday, but <laughs> um, in this direction, we've gone far enough, okay? A further study, the next thing you should study is CeeLo theorems. You already have all the tools you need to understand them, all right? That's my point. Um, definition, if G is a finite group, let P be a prime number. A subgroup of P um, of G is called a CeeLo P subgroup if the order of P is a prime power of P, P to the alpha for some, for some alpha greater than or equal to 1. And, but listen to this, such that P to the alpha is a divisor of the order to G, but P to the alpha plus 1 is not. So a CeeLo P subgroup is sort of a, the maximal prime, it's, it's a subgroup of maximal prime power that divides the group. If my, um, for example, if my group had order, suppose I had order of G equal to, you know, um, 7 cubed times 2, what would that be? Why did I do that? Let's say 5 cubed. They're 120, 250, all right? Then if you had a subgroup P um, with the order of P equal to what? 5 cubed, then um, that would be, I think, a CeeLo P subgroup for this one. Or if you had a subgroup of order 2, that would also be a CeeLo 2 subgroup. Um, yeah, CeeLo 5 subgroup. Yeah. Although, I don't know, I mean, <coughs> I would... I'm not super happy about that terminology because it is a subgroup of order 125, but whatever. If you, I do think there is a subgroup of, of, five, of order 5 squared, but that's not a CeeLo P subgroup. CeeLo P subgroup is sort of like the maximal thing. Um, so the lemma on the next page, I think I'm on the next page, yeah, back side of your first page, right? Um, let G be a finite group with G equal to, you know, order of G is M times some prime, P to prime to alpha, M not divisible by P. If P is a normal um, CeeLo P group, then P contains every, P contains every sub P subgroup of G. So like this lemma is saying if this P is also normal, in my case it has to be normal because it has index two, <laughs> right? If the size of the group is half the group, then the coset is the group, subgroup, and then everything not in the subgroup, those are two cosets. They have to be both left and right. <laughs> we prove that. Anyway, so in fact, this would necessarily be a normal subgroup. And um, what that's saying is that all of the other subgroups of prime power order have to be contained in there. All right. Anyway, here are the second and third CeeLo theorems. Um, all CeeLo P subgroups of G are conjugate. Any P subgroup of G that's contained in a CeeLo P subgroup and any maximal P subgroup is a CeeLo P subgroup. So much CeeLo P subgrouping. Anyway, and then part B, which I believe is the third theorem, which is a little bit more summative in terms of calculations. If you have N is equal to M times P to the alpha with, the grade, with, with M and P relatively prime, and if k is the number of CeeLo P subgroups, then k divides m, and k is congruent to 1 mod p. So anyway, I won't, again, the, the reason I'm not expecting you to know, if I was going to expect you to know them and use them, I'd have to go through the proofs, all right? And I don't want to spend a week of class on, on the proofs in here, because I think it's far more interesting for us to spend that time on elementary ring theory, all right? Because some of you won't take Math 422, and I think it's important for you to have a better sense of just the general structure of algebra before you leave the first course, right? No. Anyway, example, um, I think it's the front of your second page. Here's a simple application of the CeeLo theorems. He's like, 
show any, any group of order 100 has a normal subgroup of order 25. He says the number of CELO 5 subgroups must be congruent to 1 mod 5 and also be a divisor of 4. And the only possibility there is just one subgroup of order 25, which must be normal. So anyway, you can, you can look at these more comp Let me look at the, uh, where is that? Oh, yeah. The back page here. Example five is kind of, this is kind of impressive. If P and Q are primes, no, no group of G of order, so the, on example five on the last, the last of your page or handout, if P and Q are primes, show that no group G of order P times Q is simple. So if P is equal to Q, then the center of G is not equal to one. Why is that? By theorem seven. Oh man. Well, that'll forever remain a mystery to us, I guess, because I didn't copy theorem seven for you. <laughs> Humor me for a second here. Let's see if I can find theorem seven. Theorem seven, that sounds, what, what's his, how do you find theorem? What does theorem seven mean? What's his numbering? Theorem what? Section 8.2. Oh, and it said eight point, theorem 8.2? Yeah. It says theorem 7. Theorem 7 and 8.2. Oh, oh, you guys can read. That's good. <laughs> Someday I'll learn how to read. Come on. Theorem 7 said if P is a prime and G is not the identity group, um, so if you, have a, if you have a finite P group, then the center of G is not just one. What's a P group? Do you guys know? I've not defined that, I don't think. Ah. I want to say a P group is a group in which, oh, here it is. If P is a prime, a group G is called a P group if every if the order of every element of G is a power of P. So a P group, all of the elements, if you raise them to some power of the prime, they go to the identity. All right, so that was the, the theorem was that if the, if P is equal to, if P is equal to Q, that makes um, G a um, P squared, right? Which means that it's a P group. If the order of the group is a prime squared, that makes it a P group because, of course, if your order of group is prime squared, then any element in the group to the prime squared power it has to be the identity, right? Because we have that theorem that if you take the element of a group and you raise it to the order of the group, it's the identity again, right? So, anyway. Um, so if the center of G is not equal to G, the proof is complete. If the center of G is G, then G is not simple because G is abelian and the order of G is P squared is not a prime. Anyway, my energy is, is waning. My point is here, if you look at these examples, they're powerful, they're deep, and they're things that we would have a fair amount of difficulty proving with the technology that we have. So like the CELO P theorems are, they allow you to solve another class of problems that are much harder than the ones we're, we're currently tackling. Most of what I give you guys to work on really is just the definition and maybe a step or two past a theorem, right? Th these are much more computationally um, involved. But. So guys, there is, um, for Friday, I'll just tell you what I'm up to. I um, probably will have a handout for you or two there. Um, there's a little bit more of this sort of thing I wanna do. Um, you know, as far as the simple, I mean, I, they're, they're the theorem I wanna show you and, and prove for you Friday is this lattice theorem. Really, the, I want to complete the story of the isomorphism theorem. So we had the first isomorphism theorem in here, right? There's also a second and third and a fourth isomorphism theorem. That's the substance of Friday. Um, I'll say a word or two about finite simple groups, but that's not, mu that's much like this last part of the, you know, it's something I wanted for your information, not so much for, for testing. Anyway, any questions? We do have a test next Wednesday. Tomorrow, I hope to go through the solutions of many more homeworks, old homeworks. Yesterday, I went through the solutions of 
10, 11, 12, I guess. So hopefully tomorrow I'll do a bunch more. And um, test is Wednesday. Yeah, Monday we have for your, for your questions. I can move it to Monday. You want me to move to Monday? Last time I said something like that, you Anyway. Well, I'll shut up. Thanks. Yes. <laughs>